Good morning and thank you all for being here. I'm going to try to wake you up. You cannot continue working on your uh, computer. If you work on your computer, it means you don't care for people. And we are here because we care for people. The UT Portugal program is an extremely successful program because we all care to solve important problems in our infrastructure in Portugal, in Texas, in the United States, in the world. Why UT Portugal? I happen to have a little bit of an amateur historian. It was in the late 1600s that the first Portuguese started coming to New Bedford, Massachusetts, and they created a community, and they built in the 1700s the first newspaper in Portuguese called, I think, New Bedford uh, Colonial. So it was only natural that this continues. There were many people that came from Lisbon and from Porto in the late 1800s directly to Galveston and also to Veracruz in Mexico. And these were Portuguese that made part of what we call now West uh, Hills, along with others. I'm here to tell you that the University of Texas Portugal program is a great success. And it's a great success in all aspects. You heard Bob Peterson talking about how he and Juan Sanchez came to Lisbon, I think, and they created the program in 2007. I remember the program at the beginning. At the beginning, it was mostly computational work. So in 2013, 2014, we came to Aveiro in March, and it was the first time we expanded the program, and we got together. And in fact, what I'm going to talk about today is share with you the idea that there are important problems in the medical field and in our technology that we wouldn't have been able to, attack, to address if all of us were not working together. So you see some of the main collaborators of this moment. Two of my graduate students, Dennis Huang and Deidre Ward, and you're going to see about them a little bit more. And of course, Helena Florindo and uh, Luis Gracha that you saw a few minutes ago. This is where we are. You hear about biomaterials, you hear about nanotechnology, you read it in the newspapers, and you say, everything is wonderful. And then some of the naysayers say, oh, nanotechnology is not good. It's going to kill all of us. Little do they know. Because in today's world, there is a huge problem with communications. And that is that we let people that are not scientists to tell us what is correct and what is incorrect. The world is changing. The biomaterials field and the drug delivery field and the treatment fields are expanding. And they are not anymore, there has been tremendous expansion in the field. We are talking about modified biological molecules. We are talking about new structures that will be introduced in the body and will be able to act in a particular intelligent way to interact with the body to treat a particular disease. I know I have in the audience members of the group that is going to be evaluating the program tomorrow, and some of them are medical doctors. And they do appreciate very much what I'm trying to say here. And I'm going to spend some time talking about it in a rather simple way, but showing also some of the data that we are getting recently from the UT Portugal program, but with one idea. I want you to remember that what I want to see finally is what you see in yellow lines. Diagnosis and treatment of a patient. A treatment is an ability to continue having the freedom that you have without the disease. How did we start? And why is the UT Portugal program so simple? This is the University of Aveiro exactly in March 2014 where we met, I think it was John Eckert, I think it was Brian Corgill who is in the back, and several others and many of you, and a very young Helena, who was an assistant professor at that time, we sat next to each other, and it clicked. And we immediately started working together. At the same time, I had two other places where I wanted to interact with. One was the University of Minho, 
with Rice and the other is the University of Porto with Pedro Grant. And, uh, and this led to three interactions, several grants, and we got first the grant with Rui Rice at the University of Minho in Braga and uh, Guimarães, and then of course uh, with Helena. The people that you see here are two of the three, the two of the three participants are here. The third one is in Tel Aviv, and she is the one in the middle, and that's Renit uh, Sachi Fainaro. And it does show you how we already work and we already write interactions of the three places now, including Tel Aviv, to solve new and important problems. And these are the two graduate students. I have a reason why I'm presenting them. Dennis Juan and Didra Ward. They are all towards the end of their PhD thesis. Do you know what we did last year? We said what we do in research is very good, and it's helping Portugal, and it's helping Texas. But what about the rest of the world? And so I had a crazy idea. And these two people, plus Helena, plus Louis that you saw earlier, we got together and we created a September to December course on nanotechnology. And in that course, we had the support of Andrea Passos that you've seen very much, and everybody in her office. And we had every Monday afternoon at 3 o'clock, 3.30 your time, 9.30 our time, we had presentations throughout the world. We started with probably a thousand people. I don't know, we ended up probably with a few less. And it was, of course, Portugal and Italy and Greece and Cyprus and Slovenia and Cabo Verde and Angola and Mozambique and India and Singapore. And I think for one lecture, we had one person from, believe it or not, Timor Este, Timor Leste. And this is really the power of the system. This is what I wanted Dr. Fortunato to hear, that we don't contribute only to research. We don't contribute only to diplomacy. We help the new generation of people. And I have students right now from Oputu, Lorenzo Marquez, and from Angola, from Luanda, writing to me to come and work with us. And this is because we were excited. I'm bullish on the use of these systems. I want to see people uh, being treated for these diseases. And today I have two small examples in the remaining half an hour. One of which is autoimmune diseases and the other is cancer. And you can see here what happened with us. Once we met with Helena and we started combining our efforts, we said, we can do something that you don't have, and you can do something we don't have. And we started working, and we started exchanging systems, and we started sending students. And the same thing with Minio, with the other project, with on tissue engineering. So I have had perhaps seven or eight students who have come here for short times, one week, two weeks, and so on, but we've written papers together and so on, and it is an absolutely wonderful idea. And I know this fall we had another competition of Portuguese students to come to my laboratory. I haven't seen the results here yet, but I hope I will have some uh, coming our way. So this is really what the field does, and it is convergence. We talked about diplomacy. I don't have any problem with that, but it is convergence. Ladies and gentlemen, the problems of the autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis will not be solved by a chemist or a biologist or a medical doctor or an engineer. They will be solved by all of us. And that's called convergence. Translate it any way you want in Portuguese. We come all together, there are no barriers. Don't look at me. Do you have an MD? No, I don't have an MD. But I can talk with you about something that I have done because we all want to help the human. We all want to improve the quality of life of everybody. And not only in countries like Portugal and the United States, but also in Angola and Mozambique. And why not Sao Tome, Principe, in the small countries where people are dying and they don't know why they die. We know and we have to help them. So what you see here is all possible ways by which we can take nanoparticles 
and microparticles sometimes in the body and try to use them in order to direct them to specific sites to start treating certain diseases. And what I'm going to be speaking mostly is the two things on the very top, autoimmune diseases and biotechnology for cancer. But you notice if you go down, you will see applications in vaccines, biomimetic systems, and even regenerative medicine. As you know, I'm editor of the journal Regenerative Biomaterials. And basically, these are all systems that are based on nanotechnology. And when you first hear about it, especially if you are American, you say, oh yeah, he uses that word because he wants to get money from NIH. No, absolutely not. And these are the naysayers that have to stop talking that way. A nanosystem is a replication of the real system with the same components directed to specific sites. And that nanosystem has to have been tested, has to have been perfectly done chemically, has to have been tested from toxicity, carcinogenicity, mutagenicity, and so on, to be, to be used in the human. So really, that's what we are doing with this nanotechnology. At the same time, we do it in a smaller and smaller part because it's going to be easier to implement in patients. Think about you're losing your freedom because you have the early stages of multiple sclerosis, autoimmune disease. But you want to be able to run. You want to be able to continue having a life, a normal life. How can you do that if you have to be in bed the whole day? How do I know it? On December 25th, 1992, I had a problem, double vision, which was diagnosed as multiple sclerosis. And for the next 10 years, I was taking interferon beta intramuscularly once a week. And the next day, I was feeling rotten, even with Tylenols and everything else until it was discovered 10 years later that there was a mistake. <laughs> and that I had another disease, autoimmune disease, celiac, which is much easier to control. As you will see, I don't eat any gluten. But the, the problem is this. I'm saying that as an example of how we have to address questions like this. And we have to be able to come up with better solutions for the problem of multiple sclerosis, for example. And I will tell you about it in a few minutes. This is a book we wrote in 2007, the year UT Portugal started. And it was probably the first book on the field, Nanotechnology and Therapeutics. If you want to see it, just go into Google and, and type that word and you will see 90% of the book there already. But uh, this is really where we go now. This is where Helena and I and others from the group have been able to concentrate, crystallize our ideas. How do we bypass the epithelial cells in the upper small intestine, in the nose, in other areas, to be able to deliver all these unusual and active drugs, which are very powerful, to deliver them specific sites using nanoparticles. So you see, suddenly we have knowledge from materials, knowledge from chemistry, coming with knowledge from the medical field to solve very important problems. And you can see here we disrupt on the upper left side, we disrupt a particular tissue, we open up the tight junctions and we allow the transport to it. Sometimes we want to come up with targeted systems that are also theranostic systems. That means they diagnose a particular disease and they lead to therapy. You remember what I told you about multiple sclerosis? It's an autoimmune disease. What do you, how do you find it? You go to the doctor, a few months later, because you have a neuropathy, and they ask you to go and have an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. And there they see that you have lesions. But that's six months later. Some patients are already in a stage where they cannot be returned back to a simple condition. How do you solve that problem? It so turns out that in the very early stages of autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis, there is a certain protein reproduced called osteopontin. And osteopontin, if I can detect osteopontin 
very easily in very early stages, I should be able to deliver a particular drug to stop a disease at a very early stage, 15 days after it appears, not six months later, not a year later. Do you understand the promise? The promise is great. How do you deliver? How do you deliver when you know that some of these osteoponin molecules are going to be created in the brain because that's where really it appears? And they have to pass through the blood-brain barrier, the BBB. So suddenly, BBB has become a major problem for all of us. And we are all talking and working all the time, and we do that in this collaboration as well, about how to overcome it. Deidre Ward is working on glioblastoma, trying to open up the BBB for a certain period of time to allow certain drugs, mostly mRNA, as you can guess, the magic compound that everybody wants, to pass through and get into the brain. You can understand why I'm excited. There are many things to solve, but there is a promise. I'm 74 years old. It's not going to happen during my lifetime. But I know that I'm developing a new number of students. For one thing, I don't know, it's going to be very active for another 25, 30 years. But many other students who will continue working on those techniques. We are going to solve many of these problems. And all these systems that I'm talking about are systems that respond to the surrounding environment. They respond to the surrounding environment. What does this mean? They respond to the pH, the temperature, the presence of a compound. If you happen to have diabetes type 1, wouldn't it be nice if you are having nanoparticles that circulate in the blood and they realize that there is high concentration of glucose and they grab the glucose, they process it, and very often they give a small amount of insulin until the doctor comes in with a bit more permanent solution. That's the promise I'm talking about. How do you solve all these things? And those of you who are engineers, you, or physicists, you understand already that there is a process of engineering in this whole analysis. And of course, there is a process of intelligence. So intelligence is not a word that is used because we want to get money, but it is a word that is used because we want to come up with a system that recognizes what happens to the surrounding fluid. The applications are many. I'm not going to spend your time, but I will go only to the things I promised you I will do today. But there are people right now working, for example, on treatment of postmenopausal osteoporosis <coughs> using uh, calcitonin or dwarfism using growth hormones. Big discussion bioethics, which I don't have time to discuss now. Multiple sclerosis. Factors eight and nine for hemophilia. Hemophilia is a tremendous disease that affects whole families. The mothers of the little boys that have hemophilia suffer. They suffer every day. I am responsible. I transfer the genes to my little kid. And the kid is going to bleed to death. So don't tell me these are easy problems. They are not easy problems. And don't tell me that an injection is the solution. You haven't seen a hemophiliac patient to say that. If, however, you could come up with another system that will deliver that hemophiliac factor 9, hematological factor 9, to a specific, uh, to the person, and will be active, I think you have a major improvement. And in fact, when we came at UT with the first systems of that type, I recall the first five letters, or the first five calls I got, were from mothers. All five were from mothers. When can I get it from my child? It shows you how important the subject is. And by the way, I have to give, in this one, I have to give uh, part of the glory to my wife, who is also a chemical biomedical engineer, Dr. Lisa Brown Peppers. She was in the faculty at that time, and she was the one who came to me and said, do you know what the problem is with hemophilia? Of course I knew that. My PhD was in that. No, you don't know anything. You don't know the impact that it has on the families and on the mothers. So, what I'm trying to tell you is, today we're talking about science, we're talking about bringing Texas and Portugal together to solve important problems, but at the same time we're talking about 
really coming up with a new technology or new technologies that are used for patients. So what UT Portugal has done, and what I want all of you to hear is scientific work, fundamental work, translational work. Some of these things go directly and are being tried in animals or in humans. And of course, development of companies, independent companies, or sometimes passage of some of these ideas to major companies that can use these ideas. So very briefly, for those of you who have never seen that, if you want to pass some of these active drugs through the intestinal wall, you have to be able to bypass some of these microvilli and so on, which I'm glad they exist because they give you a very high surface area. And the question is, how do you pass? And the thing that all of us started looking at, and the nanoparticles that I'm working on with Helena have done that, is we have nanoparticles which can control a drug and they allow it to appear only in the upper small intestine, open the tight junctions, get through the tight junctions, get into the blood, and act on the blood. Regardless of what the disease is, it's a general platform, and here are some of the applications. On the very left in the upper panel, you see insulin for the treatment of type 1 diabetes, whereby you are not going to have to take three injections a day or whatever depends on how many candy bars you decide to eat during the day uh, to, to treat the disease, or hum, uh, human growth hormone, or factor 9 for the case of hemophilia, or Humira. Are you familiar with Humira? It's a very, very important drug developed by AbV. I don't know who makes it in Europe, but it is a drug for rheumatoid arthritis. Why rheumatoid arthritis? It's another autoimmune disease. And why is it difficult to release it? You will see in a minute, it has a very high isoelectric point. So you see the application is here in a variety of products, and it's not just a platform technology. Each one of these technologies is several PhD students and postdocs, and some of across the Atlantic, and of course all the way to Israel and trying to solve the problem. Different problems have different solutions. And look at the lower left side, also for the treatment of certain types of cancer, chemotherapeutic agents. But then there is a big problem there. The big problem is that many of the chemotherapeutic agents are hydrophobic. They are not hydrophilic. And the particles that I have been talking to you about, I'm looking at the time. I don't want to spend all your time. I want some questions and answers is at the time uh, the, we, we have to have the ability to deliver hydrophobic systems. And you will see in a little while how we do it. We have certain compounds that we add in the nanoparticles that promote the partitioning, the solubilization, the ability to have a certain drug which is hydrophobic come in the surrounding environment and treat a patient. So here is really the analysis for those of you who are a little bit more physics or engineering. Basically, you can go in between the cells and open up the tight junctions, or you can go through the cells with transcytosis or endocytosis and deliver the system. I am giving you two or three examples so that you see some of the successes. This is the case of delivery externally to the cells. Externally means I take the product, it goes in the upper small intestine, externally to the cells, and it allows the therapeutic agent to pass through the cells. The carrier itself is not passing through. The carrier itself continues and it goes into the feces. You got it? So these are not biodegradable systems. And so you can see clearly, if I show you this side here, you can see the case. Uh, I'm sorry. You can see this particular curve, and this curve clearly shows you, concentrate on just the red right now, shows you that in a new, Wister rats, pancreatized with Wister rat, where you know you have the early stages of diabetes, you are able to control the glucose. The glucose goes down immediately. 
when you take the system orally. But look at the very left side. Insulin is in the blood. And it's not in the blood as a chemical compound with a 272 nanometer UV spectrum. That's not enough. It is active, as we can see from ELISA studies. And that's very important. Be careful when you read papers, please. And those of you who follow me on Twitter, you know how severe I can become with papers that say, we have the new study that solves this. And I say, excuse me, where's the bioavailability? Did you do any ELISA studies? What are you showing me? You know, things like that. Yes, and I, I'm talking to you. I do have that terrible. It's the leftovers from the Greek attitude of 1970. But I do have this attitude to tell people that they made a mistake. The results are, uh, it doesn't show very well, is we can have an improved activity in the body getting now a case of particles rather than injections. And you know something, most people prefer particles. They prefer a system that they can take orally, transmucosally, nasally, or in another way, rather than by injection. Not everybody. In one of the earlier studies we published, and it was publicized at the same time, there was a wonderful article in the Australian journal Focus and we were so happy. It was in the cover page, and then there were blog under it. And the first comment was, oh, this is a great system, magnificent. The second, the same. The fifth comment was, what is he talking about? He's talking about pills. I hate pills. I love my injections. I love to work with my injections. I don't want any pills. And this is, again, once more, how you don't work in your little academic tower, publishing your papers, being happy that you got citations. At the same time, you talk to people. My dean of medicine, I'm also a professor in medicine, although I'm not a medical doctor. My dean of medicine came to me once and said, stop being a smart alley. Don't come to tell us what to do. Come and listen what our problems are and see if you have a solution. And I learn, and that's what I do in medicine when I'm I am there. So, and you can see the biodistribution showing that we are able to have most of these compounds in the upper small intestine. I want to show you this diagram. It has a reason. It's not only opening the tight junctions. Look what happens in this diagram. I find a chaperon molecule, a transferrin, which combines with the protein. They become one compound together. I protect them. They don't release prematurely. They start releasing only in certain parts of the body. And when they release, look what happens. It's a pepper's rendition of what happens. But at least it gives you an idea, passes to the other side, and you can have. And this is a very nice way. And we continue working on that, trying to find now saperon molecules. Uh, that work under those conditions. And you can see, for example, 24 times higher permeability because of that chaperone transportation. These are some of the students that have worked or are still working on it. Heidi is not, uh, right now with Genentech. Alia is with Gilead. Magnificent student. She was the one who has done all the siRNA work. And of course, Maria is continuing her PhD. She is in her last year. These are some other diseases. They are all autoimmune diseases. And they have one major problem. <coughs> they require treatments that require molecules that do not dissolve as easily. They have high isoelectric points. For example, rheumatoid arthritis wants an antibody called Humira. Osteoporosis wants the calcitonin. Macular degeneration, we are working actively on it right now requires a variety of drugs that will really prevent the problem. And finally, multiple sclerosis, interferon beta. It's not the only solution. I work with interferon beta. There are other processes. And these are very, very difficult molecules to dissolve. And you say, eh, it's a minor market. No, it's not. Look at this slide. You can take as many pictures as you want. And I don't mind leaving it with Andrea Passos. You can ask her to, to, to give you all the slides at the end, if it's better for you. She has the, 
they have it. I transferred everything in the computer. But anyhow, uh, meanwhile, you can, you can tweet me if you want. <laughs> uh, you, see all the, you see all this market? Tremendous market. But let's not be deceived. Taking a graduate student and doing half a year work on one of these diseases doesn't mean we solve the problem. The, I mean, the case of insulin, for example, took me 20 years. The case of calcitonin, 10 years. SIRNA delivery for treatment of Crohn's disease has taken, oh, seven or eight years already. And if you see the literature, you will see we publish, we open up the subject, and we transfer a few things to industry. And you can see the annual sales of many of these systems. And uh, the one that, of course, still interests me is the calcitonin, and, of course, a little bit anything that has to do with uh, lymphomas. Interferon is a very, very important chemical compound. As I'm not going to give you a background on interferon right now, except to remind you about 20 kilodalton molecular weight, very narrow window where it can be delivered in the body. And of course, don't forget, yes, there is an interferon alpha, which is for treatment of cancer. And we've done a little bit of work on it, which we published, but interferon beta is really what is of interest to us for multiple sclerosis. And if you look at the nerves in the central nervous systems, the system, you see what happens is the immune system goes and hits the nerves and removes some of the myelin. You see it? It's the beige color. Actually, there is an exam that I have tomorrow morning. Don't tell them that. <laughs> they will see that I have a question exactly about this slide. <laughs> I'm teaching drug delivery. And don't tell them. Don't send messages to the United States. <laughs> it's late over there, anyhow. <laughs> it's... And basically, the question is, can I come here, go into those bare sites only there, and treat those sites and prevent further opening of those lesions. You cannot return back to the lesions, to back to the original condition. Unfortunately, multiple sclerosis and many of these autoimmune diseases are not reversible diseases. All you can do is you can slow down to the, the arrival to disability. Okay? And you're going to say, in my case, what happened? I have four lesions in my brain. They haven't changed. They were from another disease, which was different than multiple sclerosis. Celiac. Those of you who have celiac, I highly recommend to you, you talk to your doctors. You want to control exactly what's happening to you. But anyhow, this is a case now where we come in and we bring nanoparticles to specific sites to deliver. You know how difficult this problem was? Incredibly difficult. And we worked with Japan together with Professor Nagai and Professor Morashita and some of my students. Tony Lohman, that you see on the second line, is my former PhD student. And the result is one graph only, the very last graph on the right. Look at it carefully. This is interferon beta given orally and getting into rats and really delivering interferon beta real, not degraded, not denatured for the treatment of a patient. And this is where you have a major excitement and at the same time a satisfaction. That what you do is not the publication. This publication has received quite a few citations, but that's not it. The main question is the satisfaction that you helped people that you come up with a product. This product is now available, close to be available in Japan, not yet in Europe, in Europe or the United States. Uh, Biogen is working on different versions of that particular compound. And of course, the other application is in treatment of autoimmune diseases like ulcerative colitis and especially Crohn's disease. Do you have any, anybody in your family that has Crohn's disease? It's a terrible disease. Diarrhea, they go to the bathroom all the time. If you don't catch it early, some of them have 
part of their intestine removed, it turns out that there are siRNAs, small interference RNAs, that have the ability to go and deliver to the sites that's, that are the beginning of the particular disease, of the Crohn's disease. How do they deliver? By having certain compounds that will recognize what had happened to that site. It so happens that interleukin-6 has a higher concentration in those sites. So give me a, nas a nanoparticle that has the ability to recognize the interleukin-6, and hopefully I will be able to target a system to those sites. And this is the first time in an hour, in 40 minutes, that I've been talking that I use the word targeting. Up to now, I have not used it. Up to now, everything you saw was throughout the body. Now, the particles are not only good particles that carry a particular compound, but they are also delivering to specific sites based on the compounds that are released. We are far away from the point, uh, we've talked to companies, but we're far away from the point of putting them in the market. And uh, very often, I want to tell you, it takes a long time to go for commercialization of some of these products. But it is a good example. Those of you who are wondering what has happened in the field of small interference RNAs, what has happened is the Nobel Prize of 2006. That's why I look at the Nobel Prizes as a great way for additional work. When Francis Arnold got the Nobel Prize three years ago, he is a chemical engineer, by the way, uh, that changed entirely our interest in uh, direct evolution. This year, when Caroline uh, Bertozzi got the Nobel Prize for click chemistry and especially for bioorthogonal reactions, we know that is going to change entirely the way we look at certain molecules, certain cells, and how we can modify them to make them go to specific sites. The same thing with Fire and Mellow, 2006. They opened our way for this work. And I want to mention especially this study from 2010 in Nature. That's a Davis et al. Unless you are in the field, you don't know who that Davis is. That Davis is Mark Davis of Caltech, a chemical engineer who, because of a tremendous situation in his family, somebody was diagnosed with cancer, discovered that he had to start addressing. He was a catalysis person. He has to start addressing problems in cancer. Can you imagine you return home and somebody that you love tells you, you are a member of the National Academy of Engineering. You are an expert of everything. Come on, you can find a solution for my disease. That's a burden that is very difficult to carry. And I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that's what happened to Mark. And in 2010, he was the first one who showed that siRNAs could be used for the treatment of certain type of cancer. Magnificent work. He's a member now of all the academies of the United States. He's a magnificent man. Uh, really one of my heroes in the field. A little bit younger than me. So these ideas, we took them with Lewis and with Helena, and we tried to apply them to our own systems for delivery of two compounds for treatment of cancer. SIRNA and a chemotherapeutic agent like Dr. Rubicin and so on. The problem with some of these compounds is that you don't just deliver the drug to the surface of the epithelial cells. No, 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 no. This time you have to put it inside the cells. How do you do that? How do you deliver it to the cells? Well, we found a way. We created compounds that had nice chemistry, but they were cationic in nature. Cationic, that is positively charged. Why? They could carry with them a siRNA because they were positively charged. And that's what we created. This is a magnificent study with Jenny Knipe, who is now at Lawrence Berkeley. And Jenny was able to come up with the systems, which is a macro particle. In it, it has these nanoparticles that are positively charged 
They arrive to the upper small intestine. They are released, and guess what now? They are captured by the cells, and they go inside the cells. And they deliver the siRNA inside the cell. Wait a minute. And then the particle remains inside the cell? So really, I changed entirely the structure of my body? No. The particle is created to be biodegradable, so that it degrades eventually. This is the one case where we use biodegradable systems. And we started working with these systems that are made by Argyet, a very nice technique that controls the size of the particles. And we are able to put the siRNA in the middle and carry them to the upper small intestine. I'm going a little bit fast because I want to show you this slide. You take a confocal microscope. And you say, they don't believe me. Let me label the particles with a thing green. The particles with green, the cell membrane with red, and the cell nucleus with blue. And let me start looking in a confocal microscope at what happened to the particles. And yes, surprise, surprise, the particles have gotten into the cells. And you can do further studies. You can see the results in a variety of papers we have published in the last six years. And you can see that we can deliver them to specific sites, and we can facilitate endosomal escape in these particles. These are some of the people that work, and it is important for me that you rec we recognize the first one, because Angela Wagner has come here several times in Lisbon with Helena, working on a number of problems. And, and, so, and the others, of course, are her assistants that work with her at the same time. Angela is now at Merck, and she's already manager at Merck. She's doing extremely well. So this nanoparticle-mediated transfer for cancer therapy, is it important? Yes, it is extremely important. You can direct now chemotherapeutic agents and cancer treatment agents to specific sites I have to finish, I know, to specific sites, and you can have the advantage of these carrier-mediated systems getting into the cell and directing conditions in the cell and treating certain types of cells. But there is something more important here, and sometimes I know we are getting a little bit crazy, both Helena and I and Luis, because we say, can we also do immunotherapy? Immune therapy, that's another burden. Here we haven't been able to avoid elimination of our particles. And now we are talking about immune therapy. Here we are talking about accumulation to the tumor, but we have to prevent something having to do with the immune behavior. And so we are developing responsive polymer particles that can be delivered to specific cells cancer cells, and at the same time, prevent immune response to some of those systems. What is immune response? Now I don't have really much time. But immune response is related to both innate immunity and adaptive immunity, and we are able to incorporate certain compounds, either as tethers or by orthogonal reactions, like Carolyn Berthorzy does, or by simply other reactions to, uh, to be on specific nanoparticles so that they can be recognized by the surrounding system and either initiate an immune response or stop an immune response. And that's what we are doing. We are working with the immune chain, chain point blockage. This is the work of uh, Dennis Huang. And we are trying with it to stop the process. Look at the various types of targets and antibodies that we could use. Uh, Luis Gratza is doing some of this work. We provide the particles. I'll just show you one particle. Uh, basically, they are combination particles that have usually an siRNA and a chemotherapeutic agent together. And you can see we can create them in layers. Uh, and this is a very important uh, slide because it's a slide that tells you about how you can reduce systemic side effects and at the same time enhance immunogenic cell death. And we have several papers, you can see them there. We have been working alone or with Helena and Luis 
trying to come up with those systems. These are, many of them are pH sensitive systems and we know how to make them, usually cationic in nature and with a hydrophobic homonomer and cross-link. This is the last comment I wanted to make because I don't have much time. Do you see that compound here? Cyclomethyl methacrylate. It's a methacrylate, so it can react with the rest of the particles. So the particles will contain it, but this is the one that we believe is related to the immune response that we are getting for our system. So right now we are at the stage where particles have been made, have been analyzed. Helena Anna Matos, who is the postdoc, it's postdoc. And of course, Louis Gatza in medicine are studying together. I don't have the result today. We do have a poster, you can see it. Uh, but basically, it shows you how we all get together to solve these problems. This is unimportant. It shows how we make them. One thing that is important is the pH sensitivity of those systems. So I'm closing with a few comments. I apologize for all these things. I'm closing with these comments. These are three more students that were in the UT Portugal program. John Clegg, Heidi Calver, and Marisa Wexley. Not in this project, in the project at Minho, in Braga. They spent quite a few weeks. Actually, Marisa was on this project, project. The other two in, in Braga. So don't tell me that the UT Portugal program is not successful. It is extremely successful. Count the papers, count the students who have exchanged, and you will see really the success. And you know something else? I want to assure you that if it were not for my friends in Portugal, we would not have been successful in many of these problems. We would not have been successful. Not everything comes from one country and one state and one university. But the fact that we work all together makes it what it is. These are some of my immediate graduate students right now. You can see Deidre, who is next to me, and Dennis to the right. And on the other side, you can see Olivia. I didn't say anything about her work, and Fabiola and Maria, and Jesus and Isabella. If you're wondering, yes, the group is predominantly Hispanic right now. Not Luther Hispanic. You have to make it a little bit Luther Hispanic, but it is Hispanic. And uh, this is the last thing I will close with. I don't know how many more years I'm going to be active. I have prepared the new generation. I hope they continue. The laboratories are about 3,000. Somebody will. Uh, inherit them, but I want to say I hope that someday we will improve the quality of treatment of our patients by detection, by recognition, and by treatment of a disease. And the goal for all this is one thing, the improvement of the quality of life of our patients. That's why I thank this program. Because although they started from areas that had to do with game theory and computational work, they were willing to accept nanotechnology. And they saw what really we could do for our state and your country. Don't forget the patients. Obrigado. I believe we still have around five minutes for questions, discussion, comments that someone from the audience, or I can start while you get uh, some ideas. You mentioned um, a lot about the outcomes of these projects with us, with other groups in Portugal, actually at least three, four groups in Portugal, and others that were not directly engaged in the UT Austin program, but I know that you have other uh, relations with other uh, groups in Porto Minho, Lisbon, Coimbra, as well, Aveiro. But when it comes to outcomes, many times, and we have been listening in the morning about the creation of new companies, 
startups, patents. In our field, it, is, it takes long. You also said many times, it takes long. I've been working 10 years, five years, eight years. So how can, when we are addressing as well our field, how we can also interact with uh, very, the funding agencies? Very good question. First, you have a solid story. You don't go with something and say, well, we did some studies, but we are not quite sure. Have a solid story. Go with some cell studies. Go with some animal studies. That's another story that I would say, <laughs> not now. <laughs> they don't know me well. I don't believe in killing animals, by the way. <laughs> I don't believe in killing animals. I send the studies to other universities or laboratories after. But anyhow, let's go. Do that and then go to your officer of your university and directly to the companies and say, we have these studies. In our case, it has worked because some of our very good projects that were immediately able to be seen, we went directly to the companies. And we say, we have this data, what do you think? And we signed some agreements. Uh, some others, we started small companies. It was very difficult. When I started Mimetic Solutions, I think we got something like four or five million dollars. We have here Brian Corgill and John, they can tell you similar cases. Four or five million dollars. It was enough to get studies for a year. And the companies were saying, well, give us a little bit more. We wanted some more studies and some more studies and some more studies. Don't despair. Believe in what you did. If you did it to get just a PhD, yes, at some point you will give up. But if you did it because you want to help people in another country, or in the world, or in your home country, I'm pretty sure you're going to be successful. Never stop. Continue working. That's my message. And do you think that what we have been facing through the last two years and three years almost, and with the approval of the mRNA nanovaccines, will help us to convince that actually nanotechnology can bring solution to patients? Because we, we still face a lot of scepticism. Uh, what I is think, changing? I, I think so, and that's why I, I love what Bob Langer does. Bob Langer and I were classmates at MIT, and he's the one who was one of the originators of the Moderna and Kathleen Carrico, who is the originator of the Pfizer. I love what they have done. I was expecting they were going to get the Nobel Prize this year. They didn't. Let's hope for next year or the year after. The Nobel Prize is not important. The important thing is that, in my estimation, many people were saved. They would have died if we didn't have those vaccines. So my answer is, yes, what we saw the last two years reaccentuates the fact that nano nanotechnology is here to stay. Also, for everybody, you are all familiar with Doxel, one of the successful drugs for treatment of cancer, which is basically doxorubicin in my cells. That's a nanoparticle. And people say, oh, I know, but that's my cells. Nanoparticles. That is the important thing. So please, I'm a big supporter of you don't stop research because somebody decided that he knows better than the rest and says nothing will work. Nothing will work. We will go back to 1620. Okay? So please continue working. I'm talking now to the young and I see many faces that were looking at me like this over on this side. Continue doing what you're doing and work with others and work with your medical schools. And shut up sometimes and listen what the medical doctors want. And then try to see if you can do it. And call somebody else from another country. Why do I work with Israel? Why do I work with Portugal? Why do I work with Slovenia? Some of you will say, but Slovenia is only two million people. But Slovenia has some great scientists that I worked with for specific problems. So the answer is be always positive. And Thank today you. I'm in a positive day. Yeah, there are some times <laughs> I'm in a negative day. And I apologize to the, the two colleagues that were talking in the back. But I'm glad they stopped talking. <laughs> so I think it's our, our time. No, I want a question from the students before we stop. They are afraid. Come on, I'm putting you. You must be students or young <laughs> postdocs or whatever. 
No questions, no comments? Ah. Uh -huh. Just, just a second, you'll get the micro. They are bringing you a microphone so that you can be recorded forever. Be careful <laughs> what you say. It's your, it's your life for the next 20 years. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi. It's, it's, yeah. uh, it's just one simple question. Uh, how do you kind of target the, uh, some tumor cells with nanoparticles? What mechanisms do you... It depends on the system. How do you target nanoparticles specific cells for tumors. Sometimes it's simply the fact that the temperature is a little bit higher in the tumor. So you send it to that place. Having a particle that contains anisopropyl acrylamide, which responds to minute changes of temperatures. Sometimes it's tethers, chains, that come out of the particle. That's why I say the work of Caroline Bertozzi is particularly important. She's able to take a biological structure and put on it vertically certain chains that can interact. Think about it. So it depends on the case. And there are some times where you cannot be uh, successful. I will close with something that I shouldn't be, but uh, I admire him. It's a colleague of mine called George Georgiou member of the National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Medicine. He knows I'm here. And he says, tell them about my theory about cancer. And his theory about cancer is, we know millions of, of, of mice that were saved from cancer. No human yet, <laughs> okay? So, and I know my colleagues in the front, they like that. So it is really, a continuous effort to improve everything. And I can assure you that the people I presented today, we all care about people. You don't add another course that you teach every Monday afternoon throughout the world. And I want to thank personally John Eckert because he was the one who approved it. He's in the first row. Uh, you don't do that unless you really care about people. And, there, and, and those of you who know me, you know I'm on Twitter, you know I'm on LinkedIn, and, and I enjoy it, and I always try to help people. So uh, in that case of cancer, there will be some cases where you will not be able to solve, not now, and others where we know what it takes. It takes temperature sensitivity or pH sensitivity or certain tethers that will go and recognize the specific system. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So thank you, Nicholas, for being here today with us and sharing Thanks. your experience with our program. And thank you all for staying. And I think now, Andrea, it's time for lunch. And we close the session.